Hey everybody, Andrew Fantasia here. Welcome back to Digital Charcuterie. And tonight it's all about days two and three of the DC Superheroes United campaign. We're going to go over all the stuff that was unlocked and announced. Uh, there's, there's a big chunk to go over, so I'm not going to waste too much time. But as always, hit the like button. Feel free to give some love to the subscribe button if you haven't already. Definitely feel free to check out my fantasy novels, We Were Wizards, if you haven't already. You can get them on Amazon right now. Do you like swords and wizards and people and with bows and elves and, and dark lords and stuff like that? Then come on, come on. You've got to check these out. I'm going to put these right here. You can freeze frame that if you want to read what they are about. But this is my pride and joy, and you can find it on Amazon right now. So check it out. It's called We Were Wizards. Okay, so we got a lot of progress made in the DC Superheroes United front. So let's just pop down into the other screen and take a look at everything, and I'll go through it all together with you and see what we got. What's new? Picking up where we left off last time, Mira was finally unlocked, and then we moved on and we got Parasite. So we're going to take a look at Parasite here. Uh, a big Superman villain, but not one of the ones they go to very often. So he's, he's not a deep cut, but he's like a medium cut. He's the kind of cut that you want to slap a Band-Aid on quickly, but you don't panic and go to the hospital. He's that kind of cut. And we have our information about Parasite here. And he looks, I just have to say, the, the mouth they put on him is really funny. So he's got this special thing where he's going to grab you and drain your power. And then based on what kind of cards you have in uh, your hand, then he's going to do all kinds of things to you. So similar to a little bit of what we saw with uh, some of the homebrew stuff that uh, Diversion Architect was doing. It's okay, Dave. They ripped you off. You didn't rip them off. <laughs> um, and then uh, Parasite's got all these uh, threats, little little threats. He's looking for innocent victims. It says here, Parasite's single-minded drive is to try to sate his unending hunger by draining the life force of others. He's constantly looking for sources of sustenance, moving to locations full of thugs and civilians with his threats bringing even more of them, or heroes with lots of cards in hand. His BAM is going to discard thugs or civilians, increase his health, and drain power from a hero. When he does that, he mimics the contents of the cards in their hand. So depending on the symbols, he might accelerate his next turn, add thugs or civilians, damage a hero, or discard their special effect card. Now that's interesting, because it says here, if you look on his dashboard at number 5, if the hero has at least one special effect in hand... They must discard from their hand one card with special effects. I'm assuming that's what it says. It's a bit covered up. But think about it. He's a Superman villain. Superman's hand is full of special effects because he has a lot of powers. So he's particularly dangerous against Superman. That adds up. And a lot of these DC characters have special powers. So he's going to be tough against them. So this might be a character who you might want to bring in some uh, Season 1 Marvel United core box kind of people. You know, get Captain America and Black Widow to fight the Parasite because they don't, uh, they have like, what, three special ability cards and then the rest is all normal? So maybe that's the way to go when it comes to Parasite. He's also going to be accumulating health because he starts off with very little. And the villains who do that frighten me, just like Hydro Man. So that is Parasite. And after Parasite, we unlocked Red Tornado, another big Justice League character. Picture of Red Tornado is just flawlessly beautiful. This is one of the most striking pieces of art that Edouard Guiton, I think that's how you say his name, has made. Like, it's gorgeous. And look at his forehead. He's an airbender. All right, Red Tornado is going to team up with Aang and the Air Monks. It's Avatar United. It's all happening. It's all canon. You heard it here first. So he is the Marvel equivalent of the Vision. He is very similar to the Vision. So we take a look at his cards here, like Vortex Generation. So he's going to be blowing... Uh, he's going to be stopping thugs, but it'll blow um, civilians and thugs away with the wind. His cards look gorgeous, perfect colors, um, and he, he's very dangerous. So I'm a little bit surprised they didn't make him an anti-hero, but honestly not that surprised. There are other characters that I would think of as anti-heroes way before I would think of Red Tornado as one. Uh, but don't be surprised if Red Tornado shows up somewhere else as somebody's henchman. That's all I'm going to say. And as we scroll down here, it says, Being the amalgamation of an android and an air elemental makes Red Tornado a pretty unique hero. His android physiology means he's immune to any ill effects villains crisis tokens might inflict on him. Hey, yeah, he can't be poisoned or anything like that. For those who enjoy them, we also unlocked new superhero and supervillain cards, and these ones are very unique. They're different from the normal decks you usually get. You got four of each. Oh, no, sorry, I lied. 
four supervillain ones, and then six of the hero ones. Um, I have never played with this rule set. I played um, where a friend of mine was controlling Sauron the Pterodactyl Man, and the rest of us were trying to take him down, but we didn't use these cards for whatever reason. We just kind of played the game normal vanilla style, and he was just operating the master plan cards and rooting for himself as opposed to rooting for us. So we really didn't do it properly. I might try this one day. I, I would love to try this one day. I just have not yet. So seeing these doesn't excite me, but I know it excites a lot of people. So I'm happy they're here. All right, after that, we got another villain. We got Gorilla Grodd. Ah, uh, there he is. What an awesome image of Grodd. This reminds me of the Grodd from Injustice 2, the video game with the spiky helmet. I've seen many different variations of Grodd, but this visually is my favorite um, because the helmet looks cool, the cape and the belt. It gives him um, a kind of striking color scheme that normally he doesn't have. The Grodd that I'm used to, that I'm not a huge fan of, is just a gorilla and sometimes he has a helmet on and the helmet's just like silver or whatever. So it's not even visually cool. But this looks awesome. He looks like a tyrant here, like a dictator, which he is. So it's fitting. He's got a big old belly too. He's pregnant, Grodd. And there's a look at his dashboard. He's going to be turning things face down, doing a lot. So much flipping cards over going on in DC. Heroes are going to be taking damage based on how many face down cards they have in the storyline, which is nuts. He is a, a mental villain. He's going to be mentally trying to take people over. So feel like that's kind of him getting into your head, flipping your cards over. Guerrilla Warfare is just a perfect pun. Uh, it says here he's a powerful villain, not only with his mighty strength, but even more dangerously with the mind control abilities he uses to subdue the heroes. And then we moved on and unlocked Black Lightning as a hero. He's one of the coolest DC heroes who doesn't get enough love. I was really glad that they gave him his own show in the Arrowverse. Um, the show was solid enough. It was pretty solid. Um, I just love the idea of him and his family and now he's a high school principal and he's just trying to do the right thing. The idea of a high school principal being a superhero is really unique. So I, I really like Black Lightning's sort of little tiny pocket of the DC universe. His cards look perfect. The black, the blue, and the yellow. Yes, yes, and yes. His lightning things on his figure are cool. It would have been really, really special if uh, they were yellow like X-Man. But I don't think he shoots yellow lightning. I think his lightning is a whitish blue. So I get it. I understand. Says he brings a lot of energy to the game. His electro blast can strike from a distance. He creates an electric force field around him so he can protect himself from any attack and he can even charge a card to perform a sudden super leap coming down like a bolt from the blue. And after Black Lightning, we jumped to this handsome gent, Despero from the planet Kalinor, who's a big old beefy magenta alien with a third eye on his forehead. There he is. His cape is swishing in the wind. DC Superheroes United, your cape game is just unmatched. Maybe Lando Calrissian, but that's the only person I can think of who holds a candle to your cape game. And let's look at Despero. His dashboard is looking great. Uh, he's got a lot of special rules there. It's a big, busy dashboard, which I like. I like when there's a lot going on with a villain dashboard. He's ignoring damage, and he's also gonna be doing mind control, which is a big thing. A lot of DC villains love their mind control. So let's see here what it says. Out on an intergalactic war of conquest, the one crucial element Despero needs for his plans is Nth Metal, which is what the, um, the Crisis Tokens are going to be representing. Hey, that's what the next sentence says. I wasn't even trying to do that on purpose. Uh, as Despero moves around seeking the precious metal, he takes a token from his location whenever he bams, attacking the heroes with more and more power, the more tokens he manages to accumulate. Yeah, he's going after that Nth Metal. Heroes can pick up an Nth Metal token from their location by using a heroic action, which they need to possess if they hope to be able to deal much damage to Despero. However, if he KOs a hero, he takes their token for himself, and once he's accumulated enough tokens, the Nth Metal supply will be enough to secure his victory. Nth Metal is a big deal in the DC universe. It also plays a big part in the roles of two of my favorite DC heroes, Hawkman and Hawkwoman. Uh, I don't know if Hawkman and Hawkwoman are going to be here, but I think the presence of Nth Metal kind of speaks for uh, a yes in that regard. So Despero, awesome. And I think it's kind of cool to note that right now, if you look in all of our stretch goals here and just look strictly at all the villains we've unlocked, Black Mask, Black Manta, Parasite, Gorilla Grodd, and Despero. Okay, the variety of these villains, it must have been meticulously planned by Simon and whoever because the variety is excellent. Every villain is kind of from a different pocket of the DC universe. Black Mask is a Batman villain. Black Manta is an Aquaman villain. Parasite is a Superman villain. 
Gorilla Grodd is a Flash villain, and Despero is a Justice League villain. So they have covered so many bases just with the villains alone. So no matter which hero you choose to play as in this campaign, there is a villain that's thematically suited to go up against them, and I love that. Uh, speaking of amazingly cool things that I love, Martian Manhunter, man, probably arguably the coolest member of the Justice League because he's just the nicest man. John Jones, the Martian Manhunter, terrified of fire, loves Oreo cookies, and is all-powerful. Uh, that's all true. Everything I said, I'm not trying to be funny. Wow, okay, he's got telepathic assault, two punches against the villain or henchman in any location, but the trade-off is no other symbols at the bottom. Martian Manhunter is one of the strongest and most versatile heroes in the galaxy. His hero deck contains two more cards than usual, and each one of them has a different special effect. This means he's both harder to defeat and more resourceful than almost anybody else. Yeah, totally. As it should be. Among his abilities are shape-shifting, which allows him to copy the actions of any hero's card in the storyline. Telepathy, which we saw he can attack an enemy anywhere or give another hero access to a card from the bottom of their deck. Invisibility to help him avoid attacks. Flight, which gets him across the play area in an instant, as well as many others. He's so powerful that it's almost silly, but... It never gets obnoxious. It, it's a miracle. The fact that this character exists as well as he does is a miracle. And then this got me very excited. The next villain that we unlocked was Mr. Steppenwolf, one of Darkseid's lieutenants. He's Darkseid's uncle, in fact. When I look at this Steppenwolf with the red and black armor and, you know, the, the goatee and the glowing eyes and the Omega symbol on his helmet and the big orange sword, I can't help but look at what they did in the Justice League movies, both versions, where he was just a big gray monster that was just all gray everywhere. And I can't help but think, like, who thought that was a good idea when this amazing look already exists and it's sitting right there? You don't have to do any other design work like it's there. It's done. The work is done for you. Zack Snyder, um, I've liked a lot of his movies, but the guy does not make colorful, good-looking movies. Everything is so desaturated and ugly to look at. I hope he stays the hell away from a United game. Let's just put it that way. Uh, this Steppenwolf looks so much better than anything the movies did with him. Man, look at that. What a great pose. He's running. He's got the sword. And it's not even a huge sword. It's just like a little blade, but it's still frightening. All right, and there's his dashboard. He's got the, the siren for when he is under pressure. He's going to deal, I can see on his BAM, it's hard to see everything, but it says here he deals two unpreventable damage to a hero in his location. And it looks like one extra damage to each other hero. So he's choosing one to do two unpreventable damage to. Man, that's tough. And he's got parademons, which are minions I thought we were going to see in Darkseid's case, but we didn't. So parademons are here, and in fact they're on his base. That's a parademon that he's standing on. They are the, the stormtroopers of Apocalypse. Uh, they're little bug things that fly around and make scary noises. So he's going to have a whole bunch of parademons at his disposal. And yeah, look, he's stepping on it right there. I guess that's why they call him Steppenwolf. hey -o. A military general paving the way for Darkseid's conquest. Steppenwolf is out for the hero's blood. He moves swiftly, favoring the weakest heroes, but taking on everyone he finds around him. Even overflows damage heroes across multiple locations. Fallen heroes get a KO token, advancing Steppenwolf's plan, which will be complete once he has brought down enough of them. To aid his invasion, Steppenwolf fills all location with parademon threats. These are not only some tough thugs to defeat, but they will each attack any hero ending their turn here. To make things even bleaker, Steppenwolf is constantly opening boom tubes to bring in new invading forces, replenishing his parademon threats. If nothing else, his existence in this game gives me hope that the rest of Apocalypse's minions, particularly the two best ones, Granny Goodness and Dasad, will also make an appearance. Because if they do, this guy, this is going to be a happy guy right here. I'm pointing at myself, even though you can't see me. So that was Steppenwolf. And then the video that came out today at noon uh, to kind of wrap up the week in review gave us this gem, which was completely not what I was expecting, the Metropolis expansion. And I'm going to state for the record, I have mixed feelings about this box. I think some things about it are great. I think just a couple things about it, maybe even just one thing about it, is not so great. But we'll go over that. But this is the Metropolis expansion, uh, what it holds inside. First of all, you are three heroes, Steel, Crypto, and Supergirl. So Supergirl was one of my most anticipated characters. She was 
she didn't make my top 10. She was probably like my 11th most anticipated character. Was ready to bet money that she would be a stretch goal. And I even said in the last video, and you can go back and quote me on it, I said not only will she be a stretch goal, she will be the most prominent character on the stretch goal box. That's what I said. So it looks like I am 50% wrong. She uh, was not a stretch goal. She's part of her own expansion. But in that expansion, folks, look at how prominent she is on that box. So much so that Jeff from the, the live stream today even commented and said, wow, Supergirl is really prominent on that box art. And it felt like he was almost addressing me directly when he said that. So I got my wish in that the Supergirl box has her front and center on the cover. It just was not the box I thought it would be in, uh, which is a very weird thing to dwell on. But that's me. That's how I roll. And then I'm just going to scroll past that for a second. We'll talk about that in a minute. Villains. Next. The villains are Brainiac and Doomsday. And that Brainiac figure is one of the coolest figures they've shown off this campaign. The chair he's in, the, the way he's sitting in the chair too, it's... They could not have nailed Brainiac physically any better. I am not a fan of when Brainiac's got all the tubes coming out of him and he just looks like Dr. Octopus. Uh, this is perfect. I was afraid they were going to go the other route, but I like this way better. Uh, and then there's this crazy thing, the Kryptonite Shard Tokens for the Kryptonite Challenge. This is going to be a challenge that you can add to any game of United. You just have to have at least one Kryptonian hero present, otherwise it will make no difference. But I like it. I'm glad Kryptonite made an appearance in this game, because I was worried it wouldn't, and it would feel wrong if it wouldn't. But let's scroll back up for a second here to Mr. Jimmy Olsen who is our first look at this brand new feature, new to DC United, Marvel has not done this yet, a support character who's going to be a gray miniature that just comes with one, one figure and one card, not even a deck. Uh, he's not controlled by anybody, he kind of moves on his own AI, but he's going to be helping the heroes, but he's also vulnerable to danger, so you have to protect him. So this kind of sounds like its own different, unique challenge mode. I don't even know if I would call it a challenge, because it doesn't make the game harder, but it doesn't make it easier either. It kind of balances out. It just adds another thing to the board to keep track of that can help or hinder you, uh, as you'll see later. But what an interesting concept. Uh, I'm curious if there's going to be a gameplay video from one of the big channels now to show off how this works. Because this is so new that uh, we really have no precedent for it. We want to see what this does. And now it can't help but think if we get Marvel... No, sorry, not if. When we get Marvel Season 4. Are they going to uh, give us a whole backlog of gray support characters that we've been missing out on for the last three seasons? Who knows? I would be okay with that if they did. But yeah, gray figures are going to be a thing now. And as we scroll down here, we can see this is a uh, retail box. But if you do the crowdfunding here on GameFound, you're going to get an extra hero in Superboy, Connor Kent Superboy with his leather jacket, there he is, and an extra support character in Lois Lane, who is my favorite Superman universe character. And, and apparently if Lois Lane ever dies, Superman goes ballistic and you lose the game, which is very thematic. Uh, yeah, she can only be played with Superman. You have to have him there as a hero if you're going to use her. But man, so it says for $35, this add-on brings Metropolis fully into the fray, protected by powerful Kryptonians and assailed by terrifying aliens. The city of tomorrow will be the battleground for the most epic struggles. Besides the iconic heroes, villains, and locations, this expansion also introduces a new feature to the game in the form of support characters that help the heroes in smaller ways. But that may need to be protected. It also brings the Kryptonite Charge Challenge in case the Kryptonite heroes start getting too big for their britches. And it comes with all of this here. And then as we go on, there's a little bit more about the support characters. It's so strange to see one of these in gray. That's funny. Yeah, overflows can put them in danger. So he's going to be popping around trying to get pictures of everybody. But if there's an overflow of the planet, he's out of the game. And then it shows off some of the heroes. There is Supergirl. Supergirl's so cool. Kara Zarel. She was Kryptonian. They gave her the name Kara Danvers. Not to be confused with Carol Danvers, who is Captain Marvel. Comics get real derivative sometimes, don't they? Now, there's a look at her cards. She's going to have very similar abilities to Superman, except she's going to focus more on heroic and less on attacks. And that, that's pretty thematic. Superman's kind of a shy, quiet guy, whereas Supergirl is more outgoing and friendly. So she would be more likely to be like making friends with people. Oh, here, let me help you, man. Let me 
Let me get you across the street. Let me pull that cat out of your burning orphanage. <laughs> That's a lot of uh, a lot of examples. I just rolled into one thing. Steel is very very cool. I love this dude. Uh, he's got a lot going on here. His hammer is going to let him do a lot of damage. He's got equipment, including armor, the hammer, and jet boots, which I haven't heard those two words used together in that way in a long time. That's so cool. And this painted version of him looks dope. Look at that. Wow. Wow. And then Crypto. Crypto the super dog gets his own hero deck. He, he bites people too. Apparently he, he gets angry. Crypto hates everybody. They said in the video that they find it very funny when he bites Batman and Flash. So that'll make for some interesting, fun moments around the table. Then we get a look at the villains, starting with Doomsday, who is just a beast. I mean, he was so terrifying in the comics. It takes a lot to make a villain scary enough that you're afraid Superman might not be able to stop him, but they did it with Doomsday. I love his refreshing mint green dashboard. It's very, very on brand. Um, and he's one of those villains that doesn't even have a health bar because you can't damage him. What's it say here? After completing two missions, heroes can move one or more of their crisis tokens to Doomsday's dashboard by spending heroic actions in his location for each token. Rescued civilians can be placed in either rescue... Okay, so there's a lot going on here. I think you have to damage him with tokens or like put enough crisis tokens on him that you lock him up, right? You have to imprison him because he starts off as a prisoner and it's, I guess, about imprisoning him. Yeah. Instead, the heroes must subdue and imprison him for good. To do this, they must attach the threats... Attack the threats, sorry, in order to gain crisis tokens, a debilitating act, which they can then used to bind Doomsday by spending heroic tope, heroic actions. But if he becomes under pressure, his master plan cards start spreading the Doomsday virus. Oh no! Playing face down cards if there's an overflow. There are no thugs around when fighting Doomsday. Interesting. Being replaced by a civilian population that Doomsday tears through in his destructive rampage. That's cool. Yeah, because you have to save people from him. He's just killing everything in his path. If all heroes are KO'd at the same time, which is surprisingly likely, it's game over. This guy's gonna be hard as hell. I can't see his ban, but it looks like he's discarding all civilians from his location, which makes sense. He's killing everyone. And then dealing two damage. I think that's going to say two damage to each hero in his location and both adjacent locations. Then move Doomsday. Wow. Jeez. And then Brainiac is going to be a whole different story. He's a much more tricky character. Sitting in his little throne of tubes. Uh, Brainiac does love his tubes. There's his dashboard, a little bit simpler. He starts the game already under pressure. Brainiac can only be damaged by heroic actions. Yeah, because you can't really punch him. You gotta deal with him in a different way. Let's see here. Brainiac is an insidious villain with plans that will take brains, not brawn, to thwart. The hero's attacks are futile against him as he can only be damaged by using heroic actions. His plan in full swing, Brainiac starts the game always under pressure, already under pressure rather, with the rescue civilian's mission filled up. Huh. His plan to add Earth to his collection involves sending in his probes represented by thug tokens in a mission of destruction. His master plan cards add probes while his threats makes them more resilient. He even uses them to attack the heroes across all locations. As Brainiac causes overflows and KOs heroes, he flips the tokens in the rescue civilian's card, filling it with probes. Wow, he just wants to probe everybody, just like a typical alien. Oh boy. I hope Brainiac loses, because otherwise that's going to hurt. And here's all the locations. Okay, so we got the Daily Planet, we got LexCorp, Star Labs, Strikers Island Penitentiary, the Fortress of Solitude, and Brainiac's Asteroid, which is also a chibi head of Brainiac. So cool. The Daily Planet needs to have uh, reporters in order that for it to be functional. So if there's no staff there, you can't use its end of turn effect, which is great. The end of turn effects, I'm not going to go over them all, but um, they are so thematic to the places. They're really putting a lot of thought into what these places are like and what they can do. Like henchmen who get stuck at Strikers Island, they can't move to other locations. So if you have like Toad and you stick them in there, that makes Toad a whole lot easier to deal with. And then this goes over the Kryptonite Shards Challenge, which allows you to make it a little more difficult to deal with a Kryptonian hero. So eventually they'll be filling up the board with these kryptonite shards. Heroes starting their turns on a location with a kryptonite shard loses access to all their kryptonian special effects, so it really depowers those heroes. And you can remove them from the game with a heroic action, but for kryptonian heroes, that arduous task requires two heroic actions. Ouch. And then Superboy with his cards and his jacket again. The colors are perfect. They're nailing it. Part of me wishes that the S shield on his card was the yellow, the all yellow one with the dotted line around it. Uh, that's a deep cut from the Superman comics from the 90s, but I'm okay with this one too because it adds a splash of color to it. Superboy is very cocky and inexperienced, so I wonder how that's going to affect his deck of cards. And then Lois Lane is our next companion. 
Yeah, that is so Lois. At first, when I saw the uh, just the miniature that they showed at, on the video, I thought she was holding a switchblade. And I was like, Lois, what's going on, girl? You, you having a rough day? But no, she's got a pencil because that is very on brand for Lois Lane. And she's always dressed to kill, too. Uh, office chic, man. Lois Lane is a stunner. Uh, and then you've got her card here and her miniature. If her location ever flows, Superman must spend an attack on her location on his next turn in order to save her. Otherwise, the heroes lose the game. No amount of flying around the Earth will reverse that. Whoever wrote these descriptions, uh, they got a great sense of humor, and I love it. So a lot to cover just in this one little announcement. You know, well, it's not a little announcement. Essentially, when I said there were things I loved and things I didn't love, I love almost all of it. I love, like, 90% of it. Maybe 80% of it. I love all the characters that they announced. I love this idea of support characters. I love how Doomsday and Brainiac work. Love these locations. The Kryptonite Challenge is great. I would say... The two things for me that, well, you know what? The one thing for me, the one thing for me that makes this a little bit disappointing is this. Everybody that I know in the Facebook groups and whatnot uh, who was talking about what they wanted to see in terms of expansions, everybody was on board for a Death and Return of Superman expansion. Everybody. That was one of my most anticipated expansions for a DC United. Like, that was right up there, top five. Death and Return of Superman was universally in demand as a United expansion box. And now that we have this, it looks like that's never going to happen. Steel would have been a big part of that box. Doomsday would have obviously been a big part of that box. And so would Superboy. So that's three crucial characters that you've removed from this potential box. I mean, you can't have that box without Doomsday. You just, you can't. So the only characters left from that storyline to adapt into this game would be Eradicator, Cyborg Superman, maybe a Black Suit Superman, and then maybe, and this is a huge stretch, but maybe like Gangbuster? Ugh. So that box is now, it's pretty much a sure thing that that box is not going to happen. And that bums me out because that was just a perfect thematic box. So it's sad that it's not happening, but I'm sure we will see those characters in other forms. And the the fact that this is called Metropolis tells me that they're doing something different here with, with the, the DC version of United, which is that their expansions are themed after just the pockets of the universe, right? The Teen Titans have their own pocket. Superman has his own pocket. Green Lantern has his own pocket. So does Wonder Woman. So does Aquaman. So does Flash. So... It looks like, just based on what we've seen, the expansions are going to go that way. So it's not going to be themed after stories, per se, but more after, you know, here's a box of all Superman's world, and you get this box. Here's a box of all Teen Titans world, and you get the Teen Titans box. It makes the most amount of sense to me that this would be a thing. The Batman box would be, you know, a lot of the Bat family, maybe a gray Commissioner Gordon even though Commissioner Gordon should be a hero. If Nick Fury can be a hero, Commissioner Gordon can be a hero. But uh, maybe a gray Harvey Bullock or a gray Alfred. <laughs> yeah, a gray Alfred would be perfect because it would be taken up mostly by the Bat family and then maybe one or two villains that would still leave room for the other expansion everybody universally wants, which is Arkham Asylum, right? So it gives me hope. Even though it's a bummer that we were not going to get Death and Return of Superman, it's not a huge loss. Uh, and the only other thing is, now that we have Crypto as a hero and we have Gleek as a hero, to people who loved the idea of the Pets expansion, it doesn't look like that's going to happen in this um, campaign. There is that. I don't know. I'm, I'm fine with... I could take or leave the Pet expansions, to be honest. Don't hate me, but uh, I could take or leave them. Uh, so that's where we left off, and then uh, we ended up unlocking Vixen because of the Metropolis box. And I adore Vixen. She's just a cool, classic character. I mean, another character who whose powers involve impersonating the powers of animals. So team her up with Beast Boy and Jaina. Jaina, Vixen, and Beast Boy. Get the three of them together and then get Animal Man into this mix too. I can't believe they had three so similar powered heroes so soon after one another too. That's a strange, uh, strange combo, but they did it. And look, she's got them all fierce as a lion. Amazing. The art looks perfect. It looks exactly like how her powers are shown. And 
her little logo in there is the Tantu Totem, which is one of her equipment, her only equipment, the Tantu Totem. I mean, I can't stress how excited the idea of having the Tantu Totem as an equipment card makes me. Like, that is when uh, I was reading her trading cards as a little kid and I read that she gets her powers from a magic thing called the Tantu Totem. That name uh, of that item just it sounded so mysterious and cool and magical and it made me so interested in her as a character I just it, it was a, one of the many reasons why I fell in love with the DC Universe back in the day so the Tantu Totem gets to be in the game remarkable there it is she's wearing it uh, thanks to her connection to the Tantu Totem Vixen is able to channel the powers of the whole animal kingdom heavy as an elephant she stomps out crisis tokens Fast as an eagle, she flies around. Tough as a bear, she shrugs off damage. Strong as a rhino, she charges and shoves enemies. Fierce as a lion, she pounces thugs. Agile as a monkey, she swings civilians to safety. And imperishable as a planaria, what, I don't know what that is, <laughs> she regenerates her body. The Tantu Totem Equipment card can even allow Vixen to use, again, the animal special effect of any of her cards in the storyline. Magnificent. And her cards are orange because that's exactly what they should be. So, she was unlocked, and now... As we end things, we are sitting here waiting for Raish Al Ghul. Another Batman villain. Another cape. Yes, another cape. This is a character I did not think we would see in a first season, but I love that he's got a little scroll on his base. Uh, he's got a tracker on his dashboard. I love when the villains have trackers. I just think it makes the dashboards look even cooler. Colors of his dashboards are all on point. Perfect. Let's see, Ra's al Ghul's master plan may be to destroy evil, but his extreme methods make him a villain who must be stopped at all costs. The game starts with only civilians across the locations, but Ra's al Ghul will keep adding his thugs all over the place and even causing overflows to convert civilians into thugs. When he becomes under pressure, his plan escalates, turning more civilians into thugs and activating them to attack the heroes. I love it when this happens. He's got many henchmen, and they're all unique characters, too. We've got here Lady Shiva, David Kane, Talia al Ghul, and Fadir Nasser. All right. Talia. I'm very happy to see Talia. She is my biggest crush in the Batman world. She's the mother of Batman's child, in fact, so she's also Bruce Wayne's biggest crush, apparently. Man, she looks cool. I hope she becomes an anti-hero, and Lady Shiva would be a great villain, too, just on her own. Uh, these guys are definitely more henchmen. I don't want or need them as their own standalone villains, but Talia should definitely be an anti-hero. Shiva should definitely be a villain. Wow, that looks so cool. So it says that the threats place a Lazarus Pit in a couple locations, which will ensure Ra's al Ghul immediately comes back with a vengeance if he's defeated anywhere near them. Of course. The rest of his threats bring the deadly henchmen in his service. Fadir Nasser and Talia al Ghul are key to the plans of the League of Assassins, so the Destroy Evil track actually recedes if they're defeated. Fadir attacks heroes and mobilizes thugs against them, while Talia advances the track if she has no heroes to attack. Likewise, if David Kane and Lady Shiva have no targets, they discard civilians or add thugs respectively. So he's going to be adding thugs, filling up the board, overflowing, trying to advance this plot to rid the world of evil in his own very twisted, misguided Ra's al Ghul way. He's got a big old scimitar. I love this. I love these four henchmen so much. Come on, Talia. Get in here. Get in here as a stretch goal, girl. We need 770,000 in order to unlock Ra's al Ghul. Where are we right now? We are sitting at 735. We are... How's my math? 35 grand away from seeing Mr. Ra's al Ghul. All right, that's it. That is everything that we have gotten so far. Uh, lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. They have talked about how huge this campaign is uh, multiple times in, in the, the videos. And I'm starting to believe that it's, it's not just an exaggeration, folks. I think this is going to be a very big campaign. Uh, I don't know how much more is in store, but I really feel like we've still only seen the tip of the iceberg, which is nuts. Uh, and this whole new thing now with the support characters might like that is that's so new that uh, it it's opening up a lot of doors and I'm sure the homebrew people like Dave like um, Meeple Monkey they are just scrambling around Nelly Nell too they're they're probably just going nuts you know getting those rules ready to to make their own support characters few people out there are making Transformers United so there you go you got your Spike you got your Sam Witwicky you got your Michaela right you can have the support characters for those all the live long day but that'll do it for tonight for uh digital charcuterie uh as uh, as we continue here to make the wait for marvel united multiverse a little bit shorter and a whole lot sweeter so i'll see you next time